because this inhibits the formation of cyclins, uh, cyclin E and CDK2, let's say, for example, and the uh, cells are arrested in this phase and they're not able to go and uh, go to the next phase of the cell cycle. So KIP family proteins, P21, P27, and P57 regulate the late phase of the G1. Then the other proteins, they also regulate the S phase and the uh, cyclin A and CDK1. P21 also regulate P, uh, B uh, cyclin and CDK1. So this, uh, this diagram basically shows that there are different proteins and different gene products that regulate the expression of cyclins and CDKs in different phases of the cell cycle. And the different combinations of cyclins and CDKs activate different downstream effector proteins, which then lead to the transition of the cell into the next uh, phase of the cell cycle. Now, uh, like I said, I'll come back to these uh, checkpoints. This is, these are the, these are very, very important checkpoints that the cell has to, uh, that the cell makes basically checkpoints that there is no aberrant cell division that is happening in a cell. So there are three major uh, checkpoints during a cell cycle when the cell ensures that there is no genomic instability in the cell that is transferred to the daughter uh, cell. So G1 and S phase, the restriction point is the point where it, uh, the cell decides if it has to go to DNA replication. If there is a damage in the DNA, then the cell will not go to the next phase of the cell cycle. So this is called a restriction point. Once a cell crosses this restriction point, it's committed to divide even if there is a mutation or a disruption in the DNA. So this restriction point is very, very important where the cell checks that um, all the components of the uh, uh, DNA replication are there in the cell and the DNA is not damaged. Then another uh, checkpoint is when uh, there is a G2M checkpoint where it checks for before it enters into the mitosis. So another checkpoint uh, is when it checks for the DNA damage. Now, um, uh, maybe when, if you would have read some papers, you would uh, have read that when you give some therapeutic agents or some DNA damaging agents, these cells get arrested in G2M phase. So when you look at the flow cytometry, you'll see there's a lot of cell arrested in the G2M phase. It's because if the da DNA is damaged, the cell wouldn't allow the mitosis of that particular cell. So there are a lot of cells that get arrested at that point of time. Then another checkpoint here is the uh, a spindle checkpoint, where, and these are also see mediated by different CDKs and cyclins, where uh, it is checked if the chromosome alignment is uh, good or not. Because if the chromosomes are not aligned properly, there could, they will not separate properly, and there could be uh, genomic instability that would be uh, leading to uh, cancer or translocation. So these are three important checkpoints that uh, the cell goes through during division. So how do we study, uh, or, and, or how do we study, or how do we come to know about all these, um, you know, there are so many proteins involved in the cell cycle. So the basic, uh, so, um, like cell cycle control basically a lot of, the interesting thing about the cell cycle is that it is conserved throughout different species. So yeast have the same kind of proteins and the processes, not the proteins, but the processes, and the controls that our mammalian cells have. So yeast we, uh, is mostly used to study the genetics of the cell cycle. So if you want to know the genes that are involved in the cell cycle control, then you can study it with the yeast. So there are two strains of yeast, fission yeast and budding yeast, because they, are, they can be genetically manipulated, like by gene deletion or replacement of the gene or alteration of the gene, and they proliferate with the haploid state, so there are no two copies of the gene because it makes it even more complicated if it's there are two copies, so it can be easily uh, studied, the gene that affects these mutations. And these genes are called CDC genes in the yeast. So most of the, almost all of the proteins that we know today that are involved and the, all the CDKs and cyclins that are involved in the cell cycle were initially found from the yeast, so by the genetic, genetic manipulation of the yeast. Then a uh, lot of biochemist uh, chemical uh, analysis is done in animal embryos, like the frog Xenopus, because it's huge. There's a lot of cytoplasm with a lot of proteins that are uh, involved in the cell cycle, and these embryos have to divide very rapidly to uh, produce the uh, em uh, embryo and the body. Uh, 
So uh, they are used like, for, an exa for example, here they are, you can take the cytoplasm from the frog and the uh, nuclei from the uh, uh, sperm, and then you can put them together and see that you can actually do a uh, mitosis kind of a thing in a test tube using the, uh, these kind of a system. And because they are huge, so you can, and they can be injected with different chemicals or manipulated, so these are used for all the biochemical studies that you want to uh, uh, know. Then in mammalian cells, which is more relevant to us, um, uh, there are a lot of new uh, methods that are coming to actually study cell cycles. As you can see here, uh, that this is called a fusy system, and these are different stages of the cell cycle which can be labeled, and this is in a live cell. Uh, live cells, depending upon what cyclin, uh, what proteins it's producing, will have a different color. And then based on that color, you can s you'll know that, you can just look at these cells under the microscope, as over here, you can see, or here, and you'll know that if it's red, then it's in uh, M phase, if it's green, it's G1 phase, S phase, G2, uh, G2 phase. So once you can visualize a live cell like this, then you can do a lot of things, like if you want to study something which specifically happens in the S phase of the cell cycle, you know that you have to uh, sort the cells that are yellow, and you get cells that are only in the S phase, and then you can study those cells. Then another uh, methods like labeling the DNA, which you uh, might have used or probably read about uh, flow cytometry, where you can label the DNA and that you can see that the content of the DNA is different in different phases of the cell cycle. So you can make out what phase the cell cycle, uh, the cells are in, or you can also label it by uh, the analogs of the nucleotide and then uh, look them under the microscope with the antibodies or with the, uh, these radio labels, so, or with the uh, autoradiogram. So what happens in the tumor cells? Now we know that, you know, this is a very tightly controlled process, the cell cycle. What happens in, a, in the context of cancer is that there is a loss of this regulation of checkpoints. That's why I said these checkpoints are very, very important. So cancer would happen only if there are some mutations or something aberrant is happening in the cell cycle, which is not leading to uh, the, where the cells are not able to stop themselves even if there is a mutation in the DNA. So the checkpoint uh, is lost in a cell there is an increased growth rate and there is escape from apoptosis. So under normal conditions, if a cell uh, is able to escape the checkpoint with the mutant DNA, let's say if there is a mutation in the DNA or DNA and it's able to escape, there is another cascade of uh, events that uh, the so-called checkpoints and the cell, that cell dies of apoptosis. But what happens in cancer is that these cells are able to escape that process. So basically, the mutant DNA is replicated over and over again and passed on to the daughter uh, cell because this process are uh, lost. Then there's accumulation of DNA damage, errors in replication, introduction of mutations, chromosomal translocation, and nucleoides. All these things happen because over the multiple divisions, the cell acquires more and more mutations of DNA, and you, which leads to more chromosomal translocations and nucleoides, and the normal cell is transformed into a tumor cells. So uh, just touching, uh, uh, changing gears here, uh, we'll come back uh, in the end, like how these things are related also. So there are something called proto-oncogenes, which I'm sure that everybody is aware of, but just a quick update, like proto-oncogenes, this example of HER2, which is a receptor tyrosine kinase. Uh, so it's a normal protein which functions to stimulate the cell division when the conditions are right in a normal cell. But when it is mutated, it changes, this so-called proto-oncogene changes into an oncogene with a mutation. And this demutated protein can uh, lead to an overstimulation of cell division and it overrides the checkpoint control. So there is no control over this and they become even independent of the external cues. So in a normal cell, it will not divide unless until it gets a signal from the uh, microenvironment that, you know, this is the time to divide. But what happens in these cases are that this, these proteins become independent of any external signal. Even if there is no signal that they should divide, they, these cells keep on dividing. Uh, then there are these tumor suppressor genes, which under normal conditions are there to make sure that the cell is not becoming cancerous, right? Like P53, I'm sure that you must have heard about P53. So P53 is that one protein that's 
leads to apoptosis of a cell if there is an oncogenic signal that it detects in a cell. So once it detects that there is something wrong with the cell, either the DNA is mutated or there is some oncogenic signal in a cell, it gets activated and it leads to the death of that cell so that there is no, uh, uh, you know, no bad cell in a uh, body that can lead to a potential uh, cancer or tumor. So tumor suppressor, just like BRCA2, for example, these are the proteins that uh, uh, help stop the tumor formation by suppression of the cell division at the checkpoints. They make sure that there is uh, nothing, uh, everything is like how it should be in a cell. If they are mutated, then the protein, uh, then uh, protein and it fails to stop the tumor growth because that's the control is lost. So like when the P53 is lost, the cells do not undergo apoptosis even if they have a mutation in the DNA. So there are, uh, this is the list here of many tumor suppressor genes that are involved in human uh, cancers, like TGF beta receptor, E cadherin, APC beta catenin, RB1 that we talked about where RB was binding to the E2F. So that is a tumor suppressor gene because it's keeping E2F in a state where it is inactive and they're not going into the cycle. Like P53, which I'm sure that you, you, at least RB1, P53 and BRCA, you all must have heard about. And these are the uh, genes that regulate different stages of the cell cycle and their mutations lead to different kind of tumors, either somatic uh, mutations or uh, like in BRCA, there are hereditary mutations as well, which makes the cells susceptible to cancer. Then these are uh, some important uh, oncogenes that we uh, know about, uh, like TGF beta, uh, TGF uh, alpha here, PDGF is here, then the RET receptor 